That's kind of going where we came from, no? They do a good uh, job of yeah. describing oh, in the book in Shadow Divers Absolutely. this yeah. mental and exercise that you go through zero. of trying to reconstruct okay. something from what you're seeing. Uh, and, 30 uh, to yes. 35 meters at zero five zero. Even though so many parts of a vessel do things that are so radically different from other parts, they all look the same. Oh, you know, it's all the same basic materials. Yes. Watch lead uh, leads. We are Ooh. thinking of navigating back towards kind of the northeast. We pushed out. So we'd be exploring a new area, but back towards the stern section. Exactly. Well, That's the plan. What we thought was yep. a patch cover, but from the other side. Yeah, it's got depth. Ridge nav. Isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Wow. A ship move, please. So, Three uh, zero meters, uh, bearing uh, zero five zero. A tank of some sorts, perhaps. Thank you. An enclosed platform. An oblong platform? I don't know. You know, along the side of the vessel, outboard? Hard to say. We pushed out some 30 meters or about about there? Uh, correct, yep. Perfect. Oh, can we see inside that cylinder? That's oh, sediment, eh? Yeah, I'm going to come around to our uh, projected course. Cog. Yeah, what is, what is that thing? Uh, shrimp? The organism or the on the bottom? Well, I think, I think both. The organism looks like a suggested shrimp. Yeah. This material? Yeah, uh, can't tell. Uh, it, mm. It feels to me like the thing on the left is suspended above the seafloor a little yeah. bit. Yeah, I think so. Got an hour and five minutes left on the bottom. Really apologize to anybody who has to go through this footage later with a fine tooth comb, but as we zoom, our depth of field becomes shallower, and we're on a platform that's moving up and down. Do you guys have a feel for the cycle of or the heave that we're seeing? Like how many meters? Do you know how much heave we're seeing? Like how much up and down, like the ranges? Six down to about six meters is the, well, five and a half. Okay. Absolute and lowest. up, that's the lowest, and how high is the heave taking us? Uh, up to eight, eight and a half. So like three meters? 
Yeah, ish. I'm going to say a max of three meters. Yeah. I'm going to come down one meter. I guess the uh, equivalent of doing this is trying to do forensic imaging while bungee jumping. <laughs> that's, that's good. Fortunately, we can welcome back John Parshall to, to the chat. And uh, John, I think your comment was on that, that, that big tub-like piece we were looking at. He suggests that could be one of the cantilever supports for a 25 millimeter gun tub. Uh, but if I have that part wrong, let me know. But welcome back, John. I appreciate the input. Is that like a counterweight then? <clears throat> Partial zoom. I was trying to back size out of this. And later. left or right? Ed? Right. This thing. Yeah, welcome back, John. I only came back a few minutes ago from uh, from a few hours sleep myself. There we go. It's been great to have uh, have your context uh, for a lot of this stuff. System health check at video. That looks like copper, brassish. Yeah. It doesn't have the mat. Maybe it doesn't have the iron. Yeah, it does look like it might have that um, that blue green corrosion tint that copper gets. Yeah. So, water pipe maybe. Algae, what do they, or mats, what do they feed on? Um, Shipwrecks, apparently. Yeah, <laughs> I, I wouldn't exactly call it eating. It's more that they kind of have special chemical reactions that they, and processes that they can induce on certain, or like substrates and materials and hmm. extract the energy from them and oh. through like different molecular reactions and chemical reactions. Thanks. Yeah, didn't we see them on the slopes of the the subsea volcanoes on the seamounts where we saw sediment that had kind of a beneath the top layer of sediment there'd be a darker stratum and we're thinking I was thinking anyway that yeah. was microbial yeah, action. Everywhere in deep sea and most substrates yeah. there is always some kind of molecular um, uh, and faunal microbial communities. Up on this they thing greatly here. vary by habitat. So even though we are seeing them here, 
that may not be the exact same TCD you see, say, on a seamount versus an abyssal plane versus, like, the sediment in a pond in your backyard. They're all going to be different. Yeah, thanks. There's a lot of it. Well, and there would the have artifact been a field. Significant discharge of, you know, fuel and oil, et cetera, associated with this event, right? Yeah. Yeah, there would have been quite a bit. And they were probably running off a bunker back then, I'm guessing. Heavy diesel. Ah. Oh. And I come and left just a wee bit. John mentioned maybe a ready ammo tin for twenty five millimeter. Oh, oh the uh the copper tube. Oh, uh, I think that diamond shape off to the right. Is that it? Yeah, I wasn't quick enough. And there's looks like there might Sorry, be another John. one straight ahead. Uh, I'll try and do the zoom, it's gonna be a lousy image, mm -hmm. but that oh too much top left top center oh there's one there and there's uh just bottom corner right similar and a depression further off in the distance with another circle right before it yeah maybe i think a better shot of that now And John says the circular structure may be an upside down 25 millimeter tub with supports. That large circle we saw 20 minutes ago or so. Probably an hour ago, who knows. Yeah, how big is it around? That's that's hard to say. This is... Muted again. We don't have our um, our scaling lasers uh, because those are our installed on, on Herc and Little Herc, and we're just down with Atalanta, so we unfortunately aren't able to uh, to measure. But if we did have them, I think they would be a smaller set of dots than we're visualizing. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I think so. Because all these things are a lot, I think, are a lot bigger than, than they look. I think so. circle that's off to the right there. It seems like we've seen a lot of that size circle on the bottom. Oh yeah, look at that. You you asked, you, or you, did you actually put the plate down that you mentioned you were gonna? Oh, that looks different. <laughs> uh, no, I did not. <laughs> I don't believe you. We, um, <laughs> one time when we were in the Mediterranean, um, we were, uh, <laughs> we looked over with Herc and uh, and saw these um, what looked like gray discs falling through the water column, and we were like, "What the heck is that?" Washers. And it turns out the the cook was uh, chucking uh, old uh, pork chops over the side, and they were drifting down to wow. to our field of view, and we were like, "No, no." <laughs> mm. Chum. Yeah. Oh, sorry, Iris. That circular object doesn't look altered at all. It doesn't look like it, like anything else. Yeah, I'm wondering. Yeah. It Portal? could have been something that drifted in from elsewhere. I don't know. It's strange. It doesn't look it metal. It almost looks plastic, doesn't it? Which yeah. they, of course, did not have at the time. Um, I mean, it's certainly possible that stuff drifted in here or sh uh, fell off ships coming overhead. This is a hey Mike. Uh, we got a few uh, few new uh, scientists and guests here in the ECC. Hoping uh, we can't get them introduced over uh, over the line. Yeah, go ahead. Introduce yourself and 
Uh, you're all this person. Uh, hi, I'm Ashley Marangvino. I'm a benthic biologist supporting NOAA Ocean Exploration. Um, I've also spent some Nautilus, so I'm pretty excited to see what you guys are seeing right now. Hey, Ashley, great to hear your hey, voice. Hey, how are you? Hey, everyone. Uh, my name is Trish Albano. I am an expedition coordinator with NOAA Ocean Exploration, and I'm actually joining you guys at Sea on Nautilus in November for some mapping. So, oh, great. great to be here. Right. and. Great to see all the exciting discoveries. How do you future shipmate see you in November? Yeah. Hi, this is Jennifer Lukens. Um, I am the newest addition, or one of the newest additions to NOAA's Ocean Exploration Office. I'm the deputy director, and I'm super excited to be watching all of this as you guys uh, go along here and wish uh, that someday I will get out there myself. Thanks, team. Yeah, thank you. Oh, I want to put a mark on this, but I'm not sure what to call it. <laughs> I don't, yeah. Bent. Uh, mangled metal. There you go. Okay. May I recommend mangled friends. anemone mound? There's a lot of anemones on it. I do like that. So I saw in the chat, I mean, are these could be related to the uh, boy, let's uh, see if we can get close enough to get you something <laughs> resembling an ID. Uh, one of our shoreside scientists, Steve Oskovich, <laughs> says it's a, uh, it's like an anemone habitat, and it, it's like it's it is a higher concentration than we've seen anywhere else. Anywhere, yeah. Which I, I it's probably because it's. It's uh, off, off the seabed, but it's also um, like not solid. It's like framed, so it, there's a, like water can move through it. That's my guess. They seem to really like the thinner yeah. like, areas, especially on the ship as well, like the railing the higher up, cables. Yeah. Um, they really don't seem to like the very solid area, so I do think it has something to do with current flow. That's yeah, makes sense. Pipe or something. But yeah, as we mentioned earlier, oh, there's a ladder. Oh yeah. Um, that well, that's, so that's the really the only indication that we have down here that it's not anoxic. Not that I expected that it would be, but it is at least some indication of the oxygen levels that are relatively normal. Steve Oshowitz is mentioning that he believes in them. These belong to uh, the metridioids, but not metridioids. Metridioids. Uh. But do not belong to Metridium species, so that would require more of a internal look at the anemone to get a proper ID. Oh no, I completely agree with him. Yep, all of my expertise in anemones, I totally agree, Steve. I disagree completely. <laughs> okay. So On general principles. <laughs> yeah. The thing that um, appears like a ladder. That's. Uh, yeah, that was just up to the side. Did vessels of that era ever use that type of shape for like cable runs overhead, like a cable tray? Uh, like uh, we don't have them in here, but we have them on this vessel. No, I, I know what you mean by well, we do actually have cable trays up to my right. Um, oh yeah, I put that in. I don't know. Uh, I think that was actually a ladder, though. There's a distance zoom, so all odds are off. Make another move at that same heading. Sure. Seeing lots of debris in this direction. Yeah. yeah. Another cylinder to the right. And interesting looking white object right there. Come on. Hold Bridge focus. Now. Yeah, we'd like to do a ship move, three zero meters, bearing zero five zero. <laughs> yep, three zero meters, thank you. Oh, with tall aircraft carriers, you need tall ladders. Yeah, lots of I them. I can't imagine the amount of climbing it took oh, to actually, get around the Akagi. 
the, uh, well, I'll reserve until we get closer. That looks quite different dimension than the first one we saw when we came on watch. Hmm. So Steve has added that the super elongate morphology of the anemones suggests it's a food poor environment and that they're very, very extended to facilitate particulate capture, which is expected because they're very deep. Yeah, that makes sense. And then John added that Akagi carried six up to nine ordnance carts for moving torpedoes, but he'd be surprised if any of that survived the, the heat of the fires. Mm. I concur with Steve's findings, especially since the few sponges I've seen so far have been stalked bolosomids that are very clear, and those yeah. guys are really trying to stick themselves out too. Yeah, I mean, it's it's a... Uh, it's amazing that there's anything living this deep. We're at, for anyone who, I don't know who said it recently, but uh, our depth is uh, 5,357 meters. Uh, and it's like, it's one of the deepest dives that we've ever conducted from Nautilus. It's the deepest Atalanta has ever gone. Um, and it, it's deeper than the average seafloor, which is 4,000 meters. So um, just seeing that there's there's, you know, organisms that are able to survive down here, it's amazing they have enough food at all. So uh, I think that we're seeing like kind of the maximum number, you know, they've, they've colonized the, the areas that they're able to survive in, which is few, but you know, they're certainly here. And and there've been a couple of fish, there've been little rat tails or something like that. Um, when we zoom out or when we move around, we see them kind of fluttering by a little bit, which uh, equally surprised to see. Did we ever get a close-up on one of these fishes? No. no. They've been pretty quick. Uh, these canisters are still... Yeah. <clears throat> So if they weren't retaining spent shell casings, there certainly was nobody on board firing these weapons in the final hours of the vessel. No, they, no, there was not. So these came, maybe they're not spent munitions, man. I mean, I can't imagine what They do look kind of like them. Um, yeah. So I think that nothing in this debris field uh, came off at the surface is is my guess um, because uh, as we've seen with other wrecks, th they will glide a little bit through the water column horizontally and not just plummet straight down because the bow uh, is designed to, to cut through water. So my guess is that um, anything that fell off the wreck when it um, when it was torpedoed or and uh, turned over would have fallen somewhere else on the seabed and this is a so i think that all of these sections of debris are things that kind of like were pushed off the wreck when it impacted the seabed mm -hmm. which is why it's in this circular pattern around the wreck right, right. so even if someone had been firing an anti-aircraft gun in the last moment uh it, those spent shells would not be here Oh, and uh, right John, John saying that the cylinders we're seeing maybe strut supports for the gun tubs, like the 25 millimeter gun tubs. That's interesting. Yeah, I can see that. Uh, he sent a, a, a screenshot of one of the plans um, up along the um, flight deck. There were those, uh, yeah, those gun mounts, and some of them were missing from the area that the flight deck was missing from. Uh. Uh, it looks like a spool cable there. Maybe a pulley. For viewers that have maybe recently rejoined us or joined us for the first time during this dive, We've got less than an hour now left as we are looking at the final resting place of aircraft carrier Akagi, uh, which was the flagship for um, 
Japan's first air fleet and was sunk during the Battle of Midway. Currently we are looking out at a debris field and we are using ROV Atalanta for this dive. Uh, a lot of you are asking about Hercules and ROV Hercules that we typically use with the lasers is only rated for about 4,000 meters and we are over 5,000 meters um, down at the bottom right now. And I just wanted to highlight too, we've got, from what I can see on the Nautilus Live site, people from over like 16 different countries right now All watching with us and viewing this place. And I just wanted to thank all of you for sharing this time and space with us. And we've had some amazing insights coming from our colleagues ashore. And if you head to the Nautilus site, you can read a little bit about them and their bios and their background. Um, see that at first, a square. So pilot and watch lead, I was thinking of putting another move more proactively in now for 30 mm -hmm. meters at the same. So that's Spanish. Uh, that's yeah, yeah, that sounds good. Just kind of keep pulling us along. Yeah. Go ahead, Sebastian, it's your rare opportunity to comment on the biology. <laughs> I just think they look like they're on a trampoline. Bridge nav. As, as we're the ones as moving. We're the but, ones, yeah. yeah. Hello. <laughs> For those who don't know what that is, that is a holothurian, or known as a sea cucumber. In this case, these type of pelagic sea cucumbers are called the flying headless chicken monsters. <laughs> <laughs> um, and they are very fun to look at. And typically have translucence, but they'll cancel on the bottom to find patches of sediment to feed on. Chita, can we do a quick spin to port and uh, Did we name it that, or ladder? is that like actually called that? That is a legitimate descriptor. Oh it's coined um, by Craig Smith over at University of Hawaii. That's um, just funny. actually have width to them, which would indicate more design for you. I don't know. More left out, or? No, just right there is perfect. Somebody can sort that out later. Great. Thank you. Give me a zoom on the fish, I'll talk even more. <laughs> so white ring around that one pipe or cylinder there. It's unusual marking. Uh, maybe a gasket or fitting. That's a fitting description. Oh, man. Should have known. Oh, way up. Full wide. Checking in here, team. Can you confirm how far outboard we currently are looking? Uh, yeah, Derek. Can you get a approximate measurement from like where we where the wreck is to where we are now? Yep. Uh, it's looking like roughly 100 meters. Okay. Thanks. Yeah, sonar's agreeing with that. Oh yeah, we're seeing just the edge of the of the wreck in the sonar, and then it's yeah. About 100 meters. Are those, those are 25 bars? Uh, 20. 20? Oh, yeah. Yeah, 90 to 100 meters out. 
and our, <coughs> our direction of travel is with the vehicle is sort of trending to the northeast. Yeah. Yeah, Hans, we put another move in to continue this line. So, Sebastian, or actually Steve, these uh, organisms off to the right, those two white, I think maybe it's just one, they must have a known size range that we could use as some sort of a proxy for scale, couldn't we? You know what I mean? Like that organism doesn't grow to be three meters wide. Theoretically, yes, but since we can't get a super exact taxa ID on it, anything we would say would be conjecture. But it's probably 5 to 25 centimeters wide. And if you can get a good scale on the rail thickness, you can probably get a good estimate when you see them. <laughs> Sorry. When uh, the ship hits the bottom, does the bottom like concave or does it spread out and like send de debris flying in both ways? Yeah, so I mean like the hull I don't think was like it doesn't splay out when it hits the seabed. It, it can on wrecks that are um that hit like a a hard like rock bottom, they can they can crack like that. Um but th this sediment is so soft it just plowed right in, but I think uh yeah, there there is kind of like a cloud of debris that comes up and kind of rains back down in this circular pattern that we're seeing. Yeah. Definitely. Are these dark spots that we're seeing here the bacteria mats that we were talking about earlier? Or is that what we're thinking? I think so. What about like the green-yellow-ish areas? I would say that's the green yellowish is definitely more corrosion, corrosion than bacteria. It's possible it's bacteria, but I'm leaning corrosion based on the map we saw on the ship. Yeah, the more orange is yellow, the corrosion generally, the more active the corrosion is, the rust. I always imagined when a vessel that size goes oh, into right. the sediment, the sediment itself is somewhat like a fluid, and it just, there's a wave that goes out. Yeah. You know, a certain distance is just pushed up like a wave. distance forward just past the crater and another rectangle off to the left. There's one way out there. So we've probably seen 30 or 40 of those cylinders. Hmm. That's quite a ways off. Uh, 
correct me if I'm wrong because I may have missed it, but have we seen any aircrafts in this debris fair or, or just like in general during this time? Uh, thanks, Tori. No, um, we have not. Um, and there were actually very few planes left on board because mm -hmm. most of them um, were doing attack runs. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, the, our, our historian colleague, uh, John Parshall, said that there's next to zero chance of there being any on board um, because they would have probably gone and landed on here you were, uh, because that was the undamaged carrier. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, even if there were aircraft, uh, like in the hangar deck, the fires that raged, for, they probably, they're all aluminum, so they probably would have melted. Um, and we, so I don't think they would have been, um, you know, visible even if they were here. So we haven't in that, while, uh, you know, we were, some of us were kind of hoping for that. Um, I, I don't, I think it makes sense that we didn't see any. Yeah. But like I said, when we were diving on some of the seamounts a few days ago, um, this whole area was, was part of that aerial battlefield. And so even when we're doing um, some other dives in, in the this far far end of the Marine Monument, um, there's always a, a, a higher than zero chance of uh, coming across uh, an aircraft, um, US or Japanese. Um, so always keeping our eye out. <laughs> I think we've sort of come back to the edge of an area we've seen before. Okay. Um, we might want to push further out from the wreck than this. Uh, my notes say that circular steel structure in the box that we imaged before should be in this vicinity. So that might be the box right there. Yeah, yeah. do you, do you think another step like... A step uh, further away from the wreck um, and then keep moving towards the stern. Yeah, I mean, my sense is that, you know, if we try to go anywhere drastically different than here, we're just going to run out of time because the, sh the, the ship moves take a while. So I think it makes sense, and Hans, you can disagree with me, Hold but I, I think it makes sense to just continue this pattern. Um, as far as, based on the sonar, I don't think in, there's all that much to the... F um, the aft side as much, um, so I think, I think maybe another step and then moving um, southwest again would make the most sense. Do you yeah, think? yeah, that'd be the most productive in terms of understanding the the debris field, and and I'm glad we did because we're getting you know a look at the interaction of the wreck and the marine environment. I mean, the only other option would be to to make a, a dash to see if we get in range of the carrier simply to rise above it when we leave bottom and that's that's dramatic but it doesn't give us anything and uh, we might not even get there in time to do that yeah i don't think we would we've got about a half an hour left so, yeah. yeah so right. uh, we could do sort of a diagonal move to the southwest um, trying to push out from the wreck and um, to the southwest in a place we haven't been yet. So that would be maybe a 40 meter move. Uh, hey. 255. Yeah, that might be worth it because, you know, the, the tow sled might respond more quickly to a diagonal change of course than a full 90. Hopefully. I don't know, I don't have experience with that though. I'm just thinking 40 meter move at 260. Bridge nap. Can we please do a ship move? Four zero meters, bearing two Fun six in. zero. Thank you. Come now.
for those viewers just joining us this morning. Aloha, ohayo gozaimasu. Um, you are currently watching a live stream of our exploration of the Imperial Japanese Navy aircraft carrier Akagi, part of the Battle of Midway in 1942. Um, this wreck sits within Papahanao Mokoakea Marine National Monument one of the largest marine protected areas in the world at over 582,000 square miles of pristine um, marine and um, terrestrial landscapes. So welcome um, as we explore this, this beautiful area. Um, for Kanaka O'ivi, the native Hawaiians, this is an Aina Akua, a place around where our deities and our ancestors um, return to after death and the place where our genesis, the beginnings of life, spring from. Um, currently, Kilauea um, volcano is erupting. Um, the eruption started yesterday and this is a continuum of the creation of the Hawaiian archipelago. So that hot spot that created these islands out here on the northwestern Hawaiian islands are currently creating more magma and lava in Halemaumau Crater in Kilauea. So a beautiful uh, genesis that spans across the Hawaiian archipelago. We're planning to do cultural protocol as um, Atalanta um, begins to ascent uh, within the next half an hour to uh, Mahalo to, to thank the, the um, ancestors and the ocean, the realm of Kanaloa for this opportunity to explore the depth.
Apple Bar. Uh, do we have a time frame of when we're going to begin ascent? Yeah, we're um, we've got about 23 minutes left on bottom, and then we're going to start coming up. Okay, mahalo. Uh, John Parshall is saying that the LVTA4 is a 75 a 75 millimeter round. Wow. Um, where did we see something that looked like that? No, no, I. Oh, you're. I mentioned it earlier, discussing okay. canisters, stored oh, canisters, yeah. okay. ammunition, and thank you for the correction. It's been a little while since I've been looking at that stuff in Hawaii. Thanks, John. I missed the comment about the section of the hangar sidewall. I was getting a cup of coffee downstairs. Sorry about that. Coffee's important. Yeah, just a nav update. So uh, it's been like eight minutes since our last move, but since we're changing directions, it takes a long time to translate that down to the vehicle. So we should start moving along here shortly. Thank you. Just explaining why our imagery is not changing. While we're here, um, can we be reminded or just uh, hear the story again of how we confirmed that this uh, is a Akagi that we're looking at? I think last night I heard after my watch that uh, the name of the ship was found somewhere. I don't know if that was on the stern or where. Full wide. Um, sorry, Tori, can you, can you no, repeat you're good. that? You're good. Um, I was just asking about if we can hear the story about how we confirmed that this is a Kagi that we're looking at. Yeah, so um, there were actually quite a few pieces of it. So the, <laughs> the ultimate answer is we did, in fact, uh, see the name, which was, um, uh, it, what's the right word? Uh, it was kind of like stenciled in, but in a raised pattern on the, on the, uh, to the, both sides of the stern at, at the very end. Um, so that was the ultimate confirmation, but there were, there were quite a few uh, features of the wreck that we identified prior to seeing that that, that helped us be completely sure that this is a Kagi. Um, there's casemate guns, which are, they were lower on, this, on the ship, uh, and they're, they're surface to surface guns rather than anti aircraft guns, and they were left over from when. Akagi was laid down as a light cruiser or a heavy cruiser before being um, they decided to change the plan and put a flight deck on it to make it a uh, an aircraft carrier and those were unique to this uh, ship uh, in addition it, had, it was unusual in that the flight deck was on the port the, I'm sorry, the island the, the island, island was on, on the port, port side and the the stack was on the starboard side 
um, and the stack was well, we didn't see it, but it was a it was a, a wider stack than other ones, and and the the tower being on the port side, there, only the Hiryu, I believe, also had that, mm -hmm. uh, but that was a much smaller uh, carrier. So those features, um, without a doubt, confirm it as a Kagi. Um, and then seeing the name is always, uh, in, in kind of just you know, that's it, just icing it, on the cake. It's just a bonus. Yeah, um, we we were confident that it was before we even saw that. But uh, it's nice. It's nice to be able to to see features and and um, put a name on the wreck. I, I did a lot of work on um, re Greek and Roman wrecks and and 19th century wrecks in the Gulf. That I mean, there's no way to ever be able to to know the, the true identity of the ship. So it's it's uh, it's nice when we have these records and, and ship plans and histories um, to be able to really like dive in and, and, and look at the details and the nuances uh, to, to identify a wreck, um, which is also just the fact that it's more recent and we have those sorts of records. Mm -hmm. Was it surprising to see the name there? I don't know how... Um, like if it was paint or yeah like we well we didn't know for sure we'd seen that it, in the plans it was um, it, it had the the characters there um, but we hadn't seen any photos that showed it so um, it was yeah. like we knew where they were supposed to be if they'd been put on so it was nice to see we were surprised though it was in um, it was not in kanji uh, it oh. was in um, it was three characters instead of two I forget. Oh what the name of it is. Um, but it, it, it was nice to see. And then we had um, colleague, a colleague in Japan, Asako, sent us what the characters should be. And that was the only way that I was able to see them through the oh, wow. either paint or, or corrosion um, because I, I, you know, it, it's not letters that I'm used to. Um, so, but she, because she sent that, I was able to, to see mm -hmm. kind of what that, and make out that they were there. Which is pretty cool. Yeah, Hiragana, I think, but yeah, June, that's June can correct yeah. me if I'm wrong. Yeah, I just forgot the word. Uh, but, you know, this, the three characters basically said ah, ka, and gi, uh, you know, and, and put those, um, you know, the, spelled out the word, which, uh, which in Japanese means red castle. Nice. Thank you for sharing that. I'm just curious now, like, uh, what was something that was maybe surprising to see that, like, we weren't expecting to find? Like, I know we just discussed the name, but was there anything else that you um, Let's see. Yeah, I mean, I think that the, the, the amount... Uh, I knew that there was going to be a, a large amount of damage because of the, the you know, the, the battle. Um, but I think just seeing the, trying to make out what was, you know, which which deck we were on, hangar deck, flight deck, and seeing that so, that so much of the uh, the decks, a lot of it was like either crumpled or torn up, and it really just kind of makes you like Yorktown was was more intact, and you know, oh yeah, clearly aircraft carrier, cool, we see that, um, and you know, we 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 saw the torpedo damage and the bomb damage, but it looks like an aircraft carrier. This one, it really shows you more what the level of destruction was. Um, and so wh while expected, that was still kind of shocking to see in a way, just just how the forces of explosions can really, what they can do to physical material. So as we prepare to, um, you know, Thank take you. our eyes off of this site of the Akagi, um, we want to just honor those over 3,400 sailors and airmen um, that were a part of uh, this battle in 1942. Um, the battle encompassed a massive ocean area the size of the contiguous United States with ships that were fighting at ranges of 50 to 150 miles apart off of um, Kuai Helani, which is currently called Midway Atoll, and in very deep waters, as you can see. 
So we just want to honor that, honor the sacrifice. And um, as we leave this place of tragedy, we honor those who have uh, given their lives as the ultimate sacrifice. not seeing too much distinctive out there. Yeah. What's um, the scale? Still 20 meters? Yes. Yes, 20 meters. Uh, there's maybe one to the, just up ahead to the left, like 15 meters out. And then there's maybe something uh, to the like 45 degrees to the right? Yeah, I think the one to the left is where we've already been. That okay. Was that pile of steel with the anemones. Yeah, yeah, okay. Well, let's see if maybe if we can go to the one that just blipped, um, like, uh, about thir uh, one, two, three, three, sixty. Yeah, you know, that's kind of far. I don't know if we'll get there. Is that an object? Yeah, we got about ten way? minutes before we... Yeah. Um, what about the one kind of straight ahead, that maybe, fi uh, 30 meters up. So right this moment, I am not pointing along our head. Tito. Tito, you got to bring your mic closer. Uh, so we're just coming around to our heading now, uh, 260. Oh, wide. So I think that's a little more accurate depiction of what's in front. I wonder what this thing is. Mud. It looks like there's a like 90 degree angle right there. Like it's a box or a container, a rectangle. Hold on. Hannah, I believe this is the rock you missed. It's what? The rock you missed. That's sedimentary layers. I think yeah, it's a chunk I saw of that. <laughs> um. It's not inside something. All right, maybe I'm just seeing it. Sometimes if it's very cl uh, clay, uh, high clay content, it can have the sort of, the sediment can have that sort of, um, uh, what's the word, uh, strike on it, or yeah. break. Yeah, it's kind of crazy because you can see like where it was disrupted to on the side. Yeah. That it went through all three of those different layers or that one layer just intruded on the one below. But yeah, I'm, I'm not that knowledgeable in sedimentary rocks. I probably just don't like Maybe a little bit more than the basic. You're, yes, you're just igneous rock people. Yeah. <laughs> I'm a hard
Hard rock gal. Hard so rock gal. Not wow. Soft rock. Just just give this sediment a few million years. Yeah. yeah. Full wide. Well, thanks, John. He addressed the propeller issue. No, no wooden pe propellers in World War II. Aluminum okay. propellers. Copy. Thank you. Uh, we're about halfway through that last 40 meter move, so I think with eight minutes left, that's gonna pull us out a bit more. But that's yep. That's I don't really see an obvious target. No, not not that we'll get to in that move. It's all right. I mean, we we could spend probably 24 hours in this debris field. Uh, so, yeah, we're we're the idea was always to get as much as we could, and that. Got quite a bit of it, I think, on this side, so it's great. Now I remember, I think the LVTA-4 had a 37 millimeter gun and also a 75 millimeter howitzer alternative. Okay, huh. <clears throat> oh, I might be wrong about that, too. <laughs> So Malia, I wanted to thank you for your reminder earlier just about the tremendous loss that, you know, took place here and just kind of keeping that in mind as we finish up this dive. Um, and I wanted to ask if you would be okay with sharing a little bit about what cultural protocol will look like once we greet Atalanta back on deck here. Sure thing, mahalo Tori. So, you know, cultural protocol has been just an integral part of everything that we have been doing since the beginning of the expedition. Um, we are in an indigenous space. We are in a Hawaiian space. Papahanao Mokuakea is our um, Kupuna Islands, our ancestor islands. And so Kanako O'ivi have a very deep um, and long connection to these islands. Um, we consider them our family, our ohana. And so coming into Papahanaumokuakea is a privilege. Um, not very many people are able to access this Aina Akua, this place that we um, consider the genesis, the place where we come from and the place that we return after death. And so that these wrecks, um, you know, that over 3,000 people who died are laying in the realm of Kanaloa, are laying in the, the realm of Po. It's a, um, you know, another layer of sacredness that's added to the sanctity of this place from an indigenous perspective. So cultural protocol is something that we do to honor the space, to honor those who have sacrificed their lives, and to honor the um, story and the history of our connection to this place. So we'll be doing an oli. So an oli is a chant. Um, it's called Oli Mahalo. And um, we do this to thank this realm of Kanaloa. Kanaloa is our god of the sea. Um, we thank Kanaloa for the beautiful um, calm oceans that have been so graciously provided to us so that we can do these kind of expeditions. Um, we thank Kanaloa for, for holding these shipwrecks in this state that they're in. Um, we thank the deities and the Akua of Papahanaumokuakea for allowing us to be in this space. And we understand that when working in indigenous spaces, we weave knowledge, our Hawaiian knowledge system, in with science methodologies to really have a greater understanding and awareness of our environment and the cultural and maritime heritage. Thank you. So we'll begin our protocol. Um, as soon as we start to ascend.
Nautilus, this is VTC. Yeah, go ahead. As we're uh, wrapping up the dive here, uh, we just want to thank you again for the excellent work that you're all doing up there. Um, we know it's not easy, and for the folks listening in, to be able to take these vehicles down uh, to where they are in this remote and sacred area, uh, it's a privilege to be able to join you all, and um, really want to thank you all, both all the technicians, the engineers, the pilots, the scientists, everybody on board. And also want to thank the monument trustees for allowing us to come out in this area and for joining us on this journey. So thank you. Now we're going to be signing off here uh, as you all have sent. And uh, we'll be anxious to join you on the next on the next dive. Fingers crossed that technology and weather hold. But in the meantime, thanks and get some rest. Yeah, thanks so much, um, and th and thanks for all the input that uh, we've received from our scientists ashore. They've they've been pulling as long hours as we, as we have, so uh, much appreciated for all of the uh, attention and and uh, advice and input and, yep. gui and guidance. Yep, thank you, shore team, very much, and thank you, um, online science team, Megan, Steve, John. Thank you for your input, and thank you, others. Team, uh, when you are um, in a position that you feel you're ready, navigators and uh, and pilots, we're um, we're ready to uh, to begin ascending. When when you are, Roger that, Tito. All good. All right. I'm ready. Coming up. Thanks, everyone. Really, uh, really great uh, piloting and navigating uh, today. Such a privilege to be doing it. Yep. Thank you. Harvey's up on him. Auto iris auto focus. to all of you for joining us, joining us in this extraordinary expedition. So we will begin culture protocol.
What was that? Just ask the ascent rate. Three hours. Yep. Bridge nav. Uh, I'm just confirming that we're ascending with the vehicle right now. If you could just hold station, that would be great. And it's looking like about a three hour ascent. So we're looking at about uh, recovering at 10 o'clock. Thank you. I'm going to be off comms, but right here if you need me. Roger that.
right, so we have the four to eight watch closing out this dive. Um, and I just wanted to take a second to thank Hans and Mike. They both, I believe Mike also left too, probably headed down to get ready for breakfast and take like a well-deserved break. So they've been up here putting in some hours answering all kinds of questions. Um, so I wanted to encourage any of our viewers right now, if you're curious about them, their background, kind of how they got started, we have biographies available, um, or just a quick bio synopsis of just not only our four to eight watch right now, but our onshore colleagues too, who gave us just so much information. And they're just such gracious teachers and answer so many questions. Yes, this is, has really been a collaborative effort. Um, just everyone working together to make this expedition happen. As you can imagine, we are out in a very, very isolated area of the Pacific and just the um, logistics of being out here in Papahanaumokuakea is pretty incredible. And so it's been a lot of teamwork, mm -hmm. a lot of uh, different agencies and organizations working together to make this happen. And some of those agencies um, we'd like to highlight are the Papahanaumokuakea Marine National Monument, NOAA's um, Ocean Exploration, the NOAA's Office of National Marine Sanctuaries, of course, our partners, Ocean Exploration Trust, uh, the U.S. Navy History and Heritage Command, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, the Office of Hawaiian Affairs, the State of Hawaii through the Department of Land and Natural Resources, and Search Inc., and the Defense POW MIA Accounting Command. Some of our other partners include the Bureau of Ocean Energy Management, the Air Sea Heritage Foundation, Tokyo University, Tokai University, Tokyo University of Marine Science and Technology, the University of Hawaii, the University of Maryland, the International Midway Memorial Foundation, and our friends at the National Park Service. So as you can see, that is a long mm -hmm. list of partners and um, this expedition wouldn't have been possible without that um, wonderful collaboration of making this happen. So we thank all of them, mahalo nui, for all of their hard work and their expertise. <laughs> Thank you, Malia, for reading out all of those partners. And I think something that I have learned just a lot about and just watching everyone work together is just like the true um, interdisciplinary nature of this work. We've got so many uh, people currently in the control van on these watches that share their knowledge about biology, geology, our archaeologists, our maritime archaeologists, but it's also just so nice to see that we've had these scientists ashore that are able to share a little bit about their work and their research and um, just so much learning. So much. I've yeah. learned so much just yeah. by sitting here and just listening and absorbing mm -hmm. all of the expertise. And um, even with our viewers, you know, we really appreciate the, um, the comments and the suggestions that come in from those who have expertise in particular areas of maritime archaeology or understanding, um, you know, the different types of um, vessels whether mm -hmm. it be their construction mm -hmm. or um, their historical aspects. You know, there was just uh, so much great information that was being shared um, throughout the, ex the, the dive. Okay. I think it would maybe be nice to have us go around the van and just share maybe one thing maybe we've learned that maybe stood out to you from this dive in particular or even our USS Yorktown dive that we've done recently because this is unlike anything I've ever participated in before um, and I feel like I learned a lot about um, just how these vessels have been designed and their purpose and especially just what uh, battle and combat looked like during this part of World War II. That's something that I've really never learned about before. So I just feel so lucky and so grateful that I've 
I've had this experience and I've learned so much about um, just this period of time. Yeah, I think for me, I just um, really understanding what depth um, temperature can do to to metal and to mm. wood. Like, just um, I really appreciated the expertise of people who shared about you know the the um, denigration, I guess, of certain materials, like um, even the mats that were created because they're feeding off of the iron. And I mean, to me, that was just really fascinating to um, see and to understand like what's happening, what are those impacts, what's going on in the ocean that's affecting these vessels. So that was really a fascinating aspect for me. Mm -hmm. What about you, Hannah? Honestly, probably oh. the... Can you your mic? Probably all the ship vocabulary. Like mm -hmm. I had, I did not know any of the definitions of a sh parts of a ship. Yeah. And then adding on top that it's like a war aircraft mm -hmm. carrier, it's just, it's so mo so complex. And I wonder how long and like how they designed, like how they came up with this design for the, their ships. Mm -hmm. I don't know. I, I've just been thinking a lot about ship making now because mm -hmm. I've never really thought about it at all. <laughs> but it's interesting. And even though I don't really know much, I can't believe how much has actually stayed somewhat intact. And we were able to at least make some assumptions or know what the different parts probably came from. Yeah, that, that's all I have to say. Sebastian, I guess it's your turn. Well, I was also very surprised about the little details that were conserved in the rack, like the bell and the bridge. Mm. And like, there's like the crest in the front of the bow. There's a lot of little things that were still preserved, even though a lot of the wreck was highly corroded and damaged. Um, I've also been very surprised at, in general, the, this and the Yorktown's biology being so sparse compared to tropical water shipwreck counterparts, mm -hmm. which have so much, usually end up building their own large scale micro communities around them. So it's very interesting to go look at the, how these deep sea wrecks operate compared to those in the shallows. Mm. Yeah, that's really interesting. You know, that kind of comparison um, between these different, totally different um, environments, depths. Um, even thinking about like maritime archeology span versus terrestrial archeology, span mm -hmm. you know, and what are some of those uh, differences in the process of you know assessing archaeological sites so underwater is a totally different um, environment you know than doing archaeology on land what is an example of like a, a previously explored deep sea wreck like what can we compare this to besides like I USS honestly Yorktown? tried to ask that question and I don't think anyone was able to give me an answer. Okay. So all I know that is that this is an extremely questions. rare event to view such yeah. a deep wreck. I think there are very few in the world that have been visited. Um, so I can't exactly give you any further information on that personally. Mm. Yeah, I was just trying to think because you know, I can only think about comparing it to the Yorktown, and it kind of had like almost the same amount of biology, maybe less, because I didn't look at the debris like we did mm -hmm. just now. But yeah, that was one of my questions. I was like, what are we comparing this to besides the Yorktown? What else is like at this depth? Well, it's like interesting to think because like. A lot of people think the Titanic is pretty deep, but, but the Titanic not. is actually about a thousand meters above where we are. Yeah, where. I actually, I just looked it up because I was sitting here wondering, just like by comparison, and Titanic rests 3,800 meters. Deep, yeah, so, so we're like 2,000 2, meters mm. deeper than that. Yeah. So what, so what is another, <laughs> I don't know. I don't I'm just trying to think of deep shipwrecks. And I, I, I'm not really a shipwreck 
Dow. So. And for any viewers that are listening, um, our archaeologists are downstairs eating breakfast, so this is us sitting here. Just yeah, we're just talking <laughs> ourselves and yeah. just thinking and just reflecting on all the learning that we've done. But I'm about to do some Googling, Hannah, and we'll see. Yeah, I can, I can see you're Googling. So. I forget that you see what I'm typing. Yeah. But, yeah, I literally, like, have a list of just questions that I was like, I could probably ask them all of this and they'd probably be stupid questions, but I really have like no idea. Like it was so weird to see that pristine like circle. Like that was crazy. I was not expect I was like that looks like it just came off of a ship. And it probably could have. Yeah. That's one of the big problems in Papahanaumokuakea is marine debris. So, you know, that's a huge potential it could have been so six yeah i haven't seen many deep shipwrecks but that has been consistent wherever we've i've been doing this for about 10 years and wherever we go in the deep ocean we do tend to find trash mm -hmm. <laughs> uh you know so it's it is a global problem and it's um, very pervasive and I know some people on board study microplastics right so they're they're finding like uh, um, Taylor Ann was saying that she's she's doing a bunch of research um, just taking like small water samples um, like a Niskin bottle just, just a few liters mm -hmm. from all these parts of the ocean filtering them and looking for microplastic fibers and finding them um, so it's it's always amazing to me that we go so far away and so deep and you can still see um, that mm -hmm. wherever we go um, but particular to this wreck I was I was amazed at how it was very interesting how quickly kind of you could see the the urgency of um, sort of trying to have technological developments um, mm -hmm. was striking on this when they said that that ship was not built originally as a carrier it was sort of like retrofitted after the fact with this yeah. huge deck on top. I mean, that's amazing kind of engineering feat. Um, <clears throat> and then just the technology that was available at the time to, um, like the, <laughs> the fact that you'd have to fly reconnaissance planes, then have satellites, you know, looking down and, and being able to see where everything was. This is kind of, when you think about the, in, the lack of information they had about um, where the opposing side was and what they were doing and how many vessels they had. Um, it's just a very different part of history than what, what, you're, what we're used to now for capabilities. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I've been thinking about that a lot too, Derek, because I know Megan uh, kind of described all like kind of the evolutions of Akagi and just like, uh, how it was built originally and what the uses were for and then um, how it was, as you said, like almost like retrofitted to kind of fit the needs as the war continued. Um, and that's just so interesting to learn about. And uh, I know we were just speaking about like marine debris and especially in Papahanaumokuakea. I was wondering like Malia, do we know where it comes from? Is it just yeah, so marine um, debris just in the ocean that the current brings it? Yeah, so there is a, a big, the, the Pacific gyre that kind of rotates, um, and Hawaii is, the Hawaiian archipelago is kind of in the midst of it, but it moves over from uh, the, the uh, North American continent um, up in the upper um, uh, Northern Pacific, comes around near Japan, and then comes down uh, below the Hawaiian Islands, so this this gyre brings mm. marine debris, surface debris, um, just circling the Hawaiian Islands. So that's been a really big, huge problem in Papahanaumokuakea, for especially for our most uh, northernmost islands. And it just gets caught on the atolls. And so, you know, the debris, most of it is like ghost nets, um, derelict fishing gear. Mm -hmm. Um, it's a huge entanglement problem for the endemic wildlife uh, that make their home in Papahanaumokuakea. Um, 
we send out three to four um, expeditions a year, um, mainly with the Marine Debris, um, Papahana Mokoakea Marine Debris Project, um, which is a nonprofit. Mm -hmm. And they've been incredible in removing uh, marine debris. They just recent trip picked up about 87,000 pounds wow. of marine debris. And, and this is, you know, hard work. Mm -hmm. You know, these are young people who really care about the environment and are going out free diving, cutting nets underwater, hauling these into the zodiacs, um, and then taking it out to the larger ship where it'll be returned back to Honolulu. Um, so it's, it's a huge work, and we're grateful to have them um, working alongside us. So yeah, um, you know, there's even in the, uh, like Derek was talking about the Marianas Trench, they actually found some cans down there, you know, the deepest mm. trench in the, in the world. So it impacts all parts of our planet. Yeah. And Malia, uh, do you have some insights into, uh, I know that there's a big problem with the plastics that know. wash up I on, uh, we'll call pressing anything. up on the atolls and beaches and the birds I, ingesting that and mistaking it, it for food. It I, I think okay, sorry about some that. of them that die that when they do a post-mortem, post they find that there's a huge amount of their oh, gut okay. contents that's okay, actually plastic. I didn't plastic. know I pressed anything, my bad. Yes, yep. We've been, um, you know, a lot of the seabirds are affected because for those, especially our Laysan albatross, um, the, the black-footed albatross, the Ka'upo, um, the majority of the populations make their home in Papahanaumokuakea. And so we have found, um, unfortunately, just huge amounts of plastic um, floating, you know, things that float on the surface of the ocean because they are feeders that their prey items are usually found at the surface of the ocean. So we have these seabirds that are coming down, scooping up um, items from the surface and ingesting them and then feeding them to their babies, to their chicks. And so we find it not only in the carcasses of the birds, but also in the bolus of the um, fledglings. So what happens is that the, as the fledglings um, prepare to begin their um, process of flight, they'll regurgitate, kind of like just make this teenage, you know, throw up, because they are kind of like teenagers. They'll throw up um, all of the items that are indigestible. And that's where we find a lot of plastics. Um, unfortunately, lighters, like, you know, they're floating on the surface, um, they're colorful, and we find just a whole lot of lighters in the bolus. Um, we found a six inch knife handle in one bolus. We found toys and fragments of plastic and fishing line. And it's it's really disheartening. Yeah. And it's you know it's a, it's a powerful lesson when we do do this lesson with um, students. You know we always want to make sure that there's a call to action. Yeah. Because you can't just do something like this and then just have that hopelessness. Yeah. So we want to make sure there's that call to action. What are some of the things that we can do individually and collectively? to really stop the plastic at its source. Mm -hmm. You know, um, it's, it's, it's a really huge problem. And I know that, you know, people are like, well, you know, you just gotta stop using it, but it's everywhere. Yeah. yeah. I plastic think that the key everywhere. thing is really, we need to tackle single use plastics. Um, we, we, we've become a little bit um, sort of desensitized to how much all of us go through. Um, you know, with our products that we buy and use. So I think even just doing something that you might think is small, like getting a reusable uh, mug or water bottle instead of buying plastic and just keep going to Costco and pick up the lady, latest 30 pack, you know, like mm -hmm. that makes it, that's going to make a big difference. And then um, the other thing that's some of the research that's been done on where like massive sources of plastic input to the oceans come, I mean, not surprisingly, they come from uh, rivers that carry the trash down from the land and into the ocean and 
um, often in places that don't have a good um, garbage collection system or recycling uh, sort of infrastructure. Um, you know, and so I think it's up to some of the also wealthier nations to help figure out how to address those sources of plastic pollution. And because if we can't stop it coming out of the rivers, you know, to trying to do a ocean cleanups is a never ending. The the sources of are just going to keep coming in. Right, so, right. Yeah. Yeah. So you know, I think you know, there's um, a lot of like um, grassroots organizations that are really going straight back to the corporations who are creating these products and holding them accountable you know how do you hold corporations accountable for the waste that they're producing um, i know that's just one aspect of tackling this but it, it is really our individual kind of um, choices as well um, you know and there, there's these new stores coming up where you can buy things in bulk mm -hmm. Um, you can take your own containers with you, um, you know, so those, there are all these different methods where we can start, you know, reducing our plastic use. Yeah, I think that's actually a great idea. I mean, it's not really new. That's been, been being done at like health food stores and co-ops for a long time, but it's not really a mainstream thing for most people. But I think it's, if you think about it, we don't need to keep buying containers a thousand times over. Yeah. What we need is what's inside them, right? So yeah, going, taking those uh, jugs back when we need new detergents and soaps or whatever, and and just getting them filled again somewhere um, makes a lot of sense. Yeah, yeah, it surely does. And you're right. This is nothing new. You know, I remember when I was a kid, and I'm dating myself, but we didn't really have plastic, and so when we like get takeout my mom would send us into the store with a pot and they would put the food into the pot in wow. our own personal pot and then we take it home and that was our takeout right <laughs> yeah. you know so i know that there's some problems with hygiene and things like that but i mean there's options if we look to the past sure. we can use the past to inform our future because you know our ancestors did it all of mm -hmm. us you know they were making do without plastic yeah another Another thing is a frequent traveler. I found like I was just started packing my own silverware. Like I'll just bring you know a fork and a spoon and throw it in my backpack when I travel. And it's really nice not to be picking up plastic utensils every mm -hmm. time you get some some food at the airport or on your on your way. You know various travels. Because if you forget that, all of a sudden you find yourself every other meal you've got a fork and a spoon that you're gonna use once to throw in the trash. You know mm -hmm. it's not a good feeling. Yeah. This is something that I think about a lot with my students. I teach an earth and environmental science class, and if I have any students listening, I have like this an idea, or I have an idea for a project that you're about to hear about, so don't be surprised if you see it in the future. Um, but I realize that for like a lot of my students, it's kind of hard to notice just like how ingrained plastic is and like kind of all the things that we use. Sometimes it's like difficult to even like figure out just like how often it shows up because I think a lot of times um, it's interesting because I have a recycling bin in my classroom like there are recycling bins everywhere around the school and you are only supposed to put plastic in those bins and that is a constant like reteaching of like we can't put this in this bin because it's not plastic mm -hmm. um, and so I think that sometimes makes it difficult to figure out like and we're still like learning and growing through like understanding like our impacts on the planet but even just understanding like the things that we're using and these materials what they're made of mm -hmm. i'm realizing is something that like uh not all of them are like super familiar with yet so i was thinking about having them choose just like any kind of object in our classroom or something that they use every day and like trace it back to like the raw materials of what it was made from because i also uh I also teach a physical science class where when we talk about like elements and compounds, like I also want them to understand that those are like the building blocks of life. Like everything we have has to come from somewhere. Like the metals and rare earth metals that make up our phones and our computers, like we have to get that from someplace. Yeah. And we think about like where those places are, who is mining them, like just so many implications. So I was just gonna have them just choose something and figure out like 
what are the raw, raw materials, where was this made, who made it, and then also reflect at like the end of whatever that object's life cycle is and figure mm -hmm. out like where would it go. Like yeah, if you just throw cool, it in the trash can, where is our local landfill, what happens with that trash, mm -hmm. how long has this landfill been here, what happens when it gets full. Um, because I'm noticing that like when we talk about the oceans and just water on our planet specifically, I hear a lot of times that like the one human impact that they're able to tell me is trash. But then I ask them like, where does this trash come from? Whose responsibility is this to, you know, work on either removing this trash or getting rid of it at the source? And like, that's a really hard question when you kind of don't know where the trash is even like coming from. Right, yeah. right. It's kind of like a problem of out of sight, out of mind, right? Yeah. We throw our trash in the rubbish can and it magically goes somewhere, Yeah. right? And you know, our landfills are filling up. Mm -hmm. we're, 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 we're taking our, shipping our trash to other countries, mm. you know? And so I think there's that real big disconnect um, that people have that the items that we're using actually have an impact somewhere yeah. in the world. Yeah. And so I, I love your approach, you know, like just look at one thing and see, like just really do a deep study yeah. and just understand like, what is it? Where, Where does, does it, it come, come from? from? Yeah. Where yeah. does it go? And I think something that I was learning about recently was like e-waste and I found a video that's just kind of like a silent documentary. I found it on YouTube that just shows like a lot of electronics that were like from countries like the United States that get sent elsewhere where people like pick them apart and take out the metals that can be reused for something else. And that was something that like I did not think about really like nowadays I know when you like have a phone that you're done with you can take it to certain places and it can be like recycled or just like not thrown away but I still don't really know enough about the process of like where does it go mm -hmm. what yeah. do you do with those materials and how much of it can be like reused well, I just want to mention something on that source project you were talking about where like where does yeah. where what are the building blocks of these products and yeah. uh, you know like I remember when I first learned that most like in plastics that we use like one of the primary ingredients is uh, fossil fuels which right. is like oh. you know not something that's sort of a logical connection for most of us. It's like, you mean oil? Like that's that whole, yeah, that's a building block of plastic. So you talk about like non-renewable resource mm -hmm. and how much plastic we generate. Um, it's pretty shocking, you know, to think about that. And um, so, yeah, we need to find alternative materials, go back to more natural materials, reusable. Yeah. Um, but I, I just don't think people are even aware that like a building block of plastic is is oil, um, and uh, you know if they had that insight, I think they would have a little more understanding of the environmental impact that comes yeah. along even just with making it in the first place. Not, a, not let alone what we do with it later. Yeah, I'll say I I did not know that. That's something brand new that I just learned, and now I'm ready to go like dive into it and definitely have my students do this project. Yeah, mm -hmm. the other one that was shocking back. was for me was uh, fertilizers, like um, sort of mass produced industrial fertilizers for, you know, lawns and fields, like uh, golf courses and things like that. Um, the same, it's like a derivative product that you can get out of fossil fuels. Mm. Oh, wow. So unless you're yeah. buying like organic fertilizer, which is, um, you know, typically from like a, a biological source, like a manure or something like that, um, then it's it's really a process that's based on um, sort of the fossil fuel um, as a building block. So that was another thing that's like, you know, n most people would not be aware of that, I don't think. So. Yeah, okay. I definitely will probably try and finish this conversation with you at breakfast, Derek. I have a ship to shore I need to do at 7.45, and I almost <laughs> completely forgot about it. All right. So, I'm hopping off SPO. Well, I and think we should all rotate. And for viewers that um, are not sure what I mean by ship to shore, we host ship to shore interactions with classrooms and venues just like around the world. If you have a classroom, community event, club, any kind of organization that's interested with talking with crew aboard the ship. Um, these are offered during the entire expedition season. Um, and you can request specific people that you would like to host and interact with your students or whoever the audience is. And they're always so much fun and I'm really excited. I think I've got a class in Florida that I'm about to go talk to. 
Well, thanks so much, Tori. Yeah. It's been a pleasure hanging out with you for, for this watch. We'll be back together on our next dive. Um, we'll see what, when, if, how mm -hmm. any of that happens. Mm -hmm. but yeah. All right. Hopping off. Thanks, everyone, for tuning in. Um, and I'll catch y'all later. Aloha. See you later. You guys want to know what I'm doing right now? I am currently drawing the, philo the morphology of that tinafor we saw in that dive. I'm drawing the tinafor that we saw in that other dive on um, King George the other day. So I found that. Like, yeah, so I found both the photos and. It looks like there's two different ways they're in the water column, so I'm trying to see if I can describe it. So, so far I can tell this is kind of the general shape of it when you like kind of look more closely. Um, that's definitely the centralized body. Oh, sorry, I'm still on SPL. Um, So Sebastian's going to share some information about some of the organisms that we um, spied over near the York. Was it the Yorktown, Sebastian? Um, these were actually during our seamount dives by King George oh, Seamount. Okay. 
at the beginning of our expedition. So just some unique animals we saw there that I've been trying to get a good idea on. And a lot of ways to help me do that is with tougher animals that have a little bit more angles on them or are very like jellyfish that are very tangled up is to draw them out myself and kind of figure out how they look spread out. So I'm doing this for this tinafore that we saw in King George that I do not recognize. So I'm just drawing it out right now and trying to figure out the morphology and see if I can deduce anything more about its taxonomic origins, if it's been discovered, etc. So it's a little pastime I do here when I, we have a little bit more low time in the dives, such as when we're rising and descending. So I love that because it kind of has like a steam component, right? The art can help to um, help you analyze and document certain um, organisms. So that's pretty cool. I'm a big proponent for steam learning because I do believe arts is a great mode of transportation for scientific information as well as conservation. And I do love seeing that there are more and more artists slash scientists slash educators coming onto the scene via social media and really spreading the word about the beauty of the ocean. Yes, I think that's so important. Art, sometimes art can express ideas, um, you know, without words. You know, that kind of very visual or um, auditory or even the, the, the senses that we normally don't use, art can kind of fill those spaces for us. Yeah, I completely agree about art and science because there, in geology, there are a lot of diagrams that we have to draw. Same with biology, too, basically. And I really wish I was more of an artist so that I would feel more excited about drawing it. Because usually when I draw it, it looks like a child did it with their eyes closed. So, <laughs> yeah, I... And y'all, Sebastian's drawing is actually really accurate to the Tina Four. I have a big thing for drawing anatomically correct animals as much as I can. It's a trait that is often taught to undergrad undergraduates that are not very well appreciated by the students because it's the old way. It's how like old explorers and biologists took notes. Yeah. And I think the way they did it was so intricate and detailed that I wish to aspire to be able to make those observations at the same level. And I think being able to draw out the animals that you look at really helps you get a solid idea of how they operate and what parts of the body do they use and what way do they use it. Um, it's just a really great way of learning about an animal without actually having to look it up. Yeah, that'd be crazy if you could like draw it from memory and just go. Or even from observation. You know, I think that deeper observation when you have to really focus on the intricacies of an organism helps you to understand it better. So just, I love that, that just very, you know, depth in observation. Yeah, definitely. I know that I looked up one time a geology map, geology art, and just the old mapping. I think I saw some old maps from France, and I was like, this is so beautiful. Like, that, it just wouldn't be made like that today. And it's just, like, crazy to think that during, like, back then, you know, they didn't have, like,